Oh, fucking A. What's up, YouTube? I'm Robert, and this is the Biker Channel. As normal, a complete fucking shit show. However, this is the third episode of the Biker Bar. And for those of you that wanted to show up 13 minutes late, you did the perfect thing because we just fucked it all up. So apparently, I have a, 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 a very, very solid grip on information technology. Good thing I do that as for a living. No. And, uh, but today's episode is actually me here in the garage with this guy, C Lock. If you guys don't know him, he just mumbles a lot. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and, he mumbles. <laughs> and then on the other end, we have this guy, Richard from Stickered. And Stickered is a company that is making custom the new standard. Richard, can you tell me about Richard from Stickered, please? What's up, YouTube? My name's Richard, and this is the Biker Channel. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, anyway, what I do is um, I've worked with the companies, and I've gotten permission from all of them, and I create decals that you can basically customize color-wise. You can add uh, patterns, whatever, from forks to shocks to wheels, frames, uh, handlebars and cranks and um, basically replace your gra your graphics if uh, you you want to uh, make your bike look a little bit different yeah so so essentially you started this this company for what reason um so I've always kind of built my own bikes and um, in doing so I would always like try to buy the parts that I wanted to buy and a lot of times a lot of these parts weren't uh, weren't available and I was like, man, there's got to be a better way to, an easier way to make my bike look like the bike that I want. And, um, I, you know, I was, I've been a graphic designer now for 20 years. So I basically said, okay, what if we went into making the decals? And that's a much easier way to make your fork match your frame or vice versa. And uh, so we got into that. And, you know, I had a business partner in the beginning and uh, he was in the bike industry. So, we started using our connections to actually reach out to all the bike companies, connect ourselves with them, get their permission, and uh, become kind of a aftermarket reproduction company. Um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. So essentially, you 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 were always always like just like redoing your own bike, and you felt like there wasn't somebody that had what you were looking for. Um, not necessarily. There are some other companies out there doing what I'm doing. What I wanted to do was approach it from a, um, you know, what I would call a legal standpoint. And what that comes down to is I'm, I'm out here in San Jose, which is close to, I mean, I've got Santa Cruz, I've got Specialized, I've got Ibis, uh, Praxis Works, you know, uh, it's, we're, we're right in the middle of, you know, mountain bike Mecca, if you will, you know, Mount Tamalpais is an hour from us where mountain biking was basically born. So I wanted to work with the companies rather than stealing their intellectual property and just reproducing decals. And so, you know, I, I've made contact with these companies through going to Interbike and just emailing and uh, even physical meetings with these guys and showing them, hey, look at this. We can help you sell more product because now instead of somebody going and buying a different product simply because, you know, there's somebody who had a red one instead of a green one. Now you can make a green one and somebody will buy your product, you know. Um, it gives people the flexibility to buy what they want rather than having to settle for something else simply because of a color choice, you know? I can say too, like in my, in my experience, like down, like as I've been building bikes and like rebuilding bikes, I, I bought, you. I, I typically buy used bikes. And so like when I was buying used bikes that were aluminum, you know, I'd go get them powder coated and then I'd want to go get, get stickers done. And to be quite frank, like I, I would just get on eBay and look for them and mm -hmm. that. And then, you know, it, it really shocked me, though, is that, like, I never really understood why, like, I couldn't call, like, go to Cannondale's website and say, hey, I want pink, and they, they could send it, or, hey, I want, you know, yellow in this, you know, in this year, and they could they could sell them. And so whenever I would go on eBay, it would only be, like, you know, a, a, a couple of companies, like, globally that even offered something like that. And then you yeah. couldn't do anything custom like I, I, as far as you could go was get the font that's like the cannondale font or get the santa cruz font and the year of your bike and then maybe change the color but but you on this hand like like you 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 do it like that where it's just like the stock graphic design 
and different colors, but you also do like custom on top of that, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've done, uh, you know, some of the more popular kind of super custom pieces are, uh, you know, camo, different camouflages, um, wood grain. Um, some people want like forest in the background. Um, I mean, it runs the gamut really like on the spot. I'm kind of, I saw, I saw a bike that got a lot of Instagram traffic. That was, uh, it was like all the decals were uh, shiny metallic gold, just like the yeah. Kashima. So yeah, we've we've uh, we've got a metallic material. It's a, it's a chrome material, so it starts off silver, and I can actually print colors on top of that, and it, I can basically kind of replicate several different uh, uh, colors, be it gold or like metallic green, metallic red. Basically, I can make it look like anodized. Uh, you know, anodized aluminum, right? So, you know, one of the cool features I found, <clears throat> I work with uh, i9 directly and they have, obviously you can go in and choose your spoke and nipple colors and you get these cool, you know, metallic green or metallic yellow or metallic purple spokes. And then what I did is I was like, hey, why don't we offer the decals for your wheels in a metallic as well so it matches the spokes. And it's actually been a really popular um, uh, option for a lot of people. That's actually pretty cool because I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of the things that bothers me the most about anodization is whenever you're customizing is actually trying to match those colors. So it is really cool that that a company like them they'll they'll build build your wheel out like that because I, I've ordered the nipples before and then they don't match my hub and then I have to order other ones until I can actually see that. But then to be able to get like actually your decals on your bike to match that as well that that's pretty sick. So I want to step away from exactly what you guys do for a business just for a minute. Yep. And I want to talk about you as a, as a rider yourself. Like, how did you get into mountain biking, dude? Um, Man, I was probably about my senior year in high school. And I had a buddy of mine that was big into mountain biking. His name was Hondro, short for Alejandro. And uh, dude had like all the coolest bikes back then, like the intense SOCOM. And he had like the big downhill bikes and stuff and what year are we talking about this point because when i say i was in high school compared to when you say you were in high school it might not have been the same thing so uh 97 was my senior year okay so, so we're almost the same age then yeah yeah that's because we're brothers according to the internet anyway every yeah. time i post a picture on instagram with me and richard everybody's like oh it's that must be your brother he actually introed a video that we did together and I had a bunch of people comment that they didn't even know that it wasn't me. <laughs> nice. I was nice. like, I thought I actually had some branding, but apparently not. <laughs> it's really good branding. We both have top tier branding. It just happens to be the same brand. <laughs> Big round guy with a beard. <laughs> yep. Who knew so, that wasn't a staple of society? <laughs> so, so this guy, so this guy um, is in high school with you, and he has all the rad bikes, and he just invites you out, or. Well, I mean, he and I used to, so we used to do like a lot of custom graphic design stuff together. He, he was real big in the rave scene and he was doing like video production at the time. And, but he still needed like help with a lot of the, like the, the printed pieces and stuff for like all the huge parties. And I, I would help him out with that. And, you know, I was like, dude, these bikes are sweet. And he's like, yeah, you got to come out and ride sometimes. So he took me out and like threw me over the sides of cliffs on these things. And, you know, lo and behold, I ended up at the bottom of the hill safe and, I was just like, man, this is this is like riding a roller coaster that I'm in control of, and it's fantastic, you know. And um, I went away to college after that, down to Cal Poly, and I started working with some of the local bike shops, doing graphic design for those guys. Got my so you're first for graphic design at that time as well, right? Yeah, I was I was in, so fine arts graphic design was my was my major. Okay, and cool. Yeah, so I did some graphic design work for this one bike shop, and they traded me a bike for it, and it's it's been. Uh, I haven't looked back since, man. I've been riding since then, um, and you're a, you're a big dude like I am. I'm, I think you're. I don't know. If, if, I guess you're not a lady, so I don't have to worry about asking about your weight. But I think you're you're probably about two fifty, something like that, right? Yeah, I I, I uh, have a right around two forty on a good uh, day, you know. So, so what what is as being a bigger guy? What is something that like that you look at mountain biking different than than maybe the rest of the other people out there? Um. First and foremost, modulation is not a thing when you're a big guy on brakes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what did I say the other day? That modulation is a Native American term for brakes that don't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know. So, you know, a lot, a lot of things that people find amazing on bikes that are like 
So you and me are what are called non-rider specific because we are literally outside the gamut of what uh, bike companies create for. Most bike companies create bikes for dudes that go from about 120 to 180 pounds. That's the that's the gauge that uh, the mountain biking community falls within. And so, you know, being a bigger guy, there's a lot of stuff that we have to look at differently when we choose a bike. Um, you know, for instance, I really enjoy wider rims with a little bit wider tire. Um, I've come to love 29er bikes because it offers a bigger tire patch contact, which gives me better grip and a little bit more security when I'm riding. Have you um, raced 27.5 plus yet, or are you? I have, I have. I, I, I actually, uh, I demoed a an HD3 back when they came out with the 2.8 tires, um, and took that up to Downeyville and Marstar. Personally, I like the 275 plus better than the 29er. Yeah, I feel like it still has some agility to it, and I and I feel like it has even more hookup as far as the tire goes. But um, so to you, the 29er though, it, you you like that. This is only within the last couple of years, though, man. Because honestly, I had uh, when I was waiting for one of my frames. Actually, my buddy lent me his. Um, it was a Rip Niner, and this was probably 2012, 2013. And I fucking hated that bike, man. It was, it was like tall and like I just felt like I was on top of a, a penny farthing, you know. Um, but now um my bike back here i'm riding the uh the ibis gen 3 ripley with the ls so it's the longer slacker version um these bikes i i demoed this bike four times four separate times before i bought one and i didn't want to like 29ers because i you know you know how it goes right 26 everybody's like oh fuck 29 and then you know 27.5 came out and people were like fuck 27.5 and then people jump to 27.5 phase two because i know this like you you were a dh guy yeah, I came from strictly DH, you know. Yeah. Um, you, were, you weren't you were just doing like lift access stuff or yeah, we would shuttle and do lift access. I mean, unfortunately there were times where I had to try and pedal my bike up hills um, just to get up there. But the 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 shorter travel bikes just to me weren't working for guys my size, you know. And uh probably around 2013, 14, I started to go a little bit shorter travel bikes and from from 2014 to 2018, man, these bikes have absolutely just become a whole different beast, man. They're insane how good they are. So, from 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 all all that perspective, then um, you're you're moving on into the 29er. You're digging the the, the Ibis. Yeah, um, absolutely. What? How do you feel about about frames? Like, do you think it matters whether it's aluminum or carbon? The only the largest difference I've noticed between aluminum and carbon, um, you know, there's a negligible weight savings, obviously, but carbon deadens the trail chatter a ton. You know, I had an aluminum bike where I actually put on carbon cranks, carbon bars, and carbon wheels, and the ride difference was so tangible that I was like, I was like, man, I can't even imagine what this combined with a carbon frame could be like. And finally, I got on a carbon frame, and I was just like, ah. Oh, now I don't have to worry about all this feedback. I can actually concentrate on going faster, you know, body positioning, um, you know, pedaling through sections that before I would just be like holding on and going, duh, 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 you know, um, so man, it's good. You know, think that transfers down to the smaller guys too. I can only imagine it does. Yeah. I know for me, like whenever I, um, first ride like like rode like a 27.5 plus tire like it just for me i felt like wow this must be what it feels like for a skinny guy to ride regular tires possibly would, you know you know it's like the way it hooks up and stuff like that and with frame the frame material i'm not necessarily always sure like what the difference is to tell you the truth i know like like uh technologically it's not flexing as much whenever i'm i'm putting load on it which is pretty much if i sit on it right. so I, that has to has to apply for something but um i don't know if carbon's always the way to go personally you know, i know when i first got like carbon handlebars for example i really felt like they 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 were a little rougher on the ride than really than, and that could I, be true i mean they're dude uh, some carbon bars could be running a thicker carbon layup which will probably uh add to that we're in a we're in a weird place where everybody there's a dichotomy of of terminology really when you when it comes to mountain bikes right people want stiff but pliable right 
So everybody's always just like, oh, the bike's super stiff, but it's also really, uh, you can you can just really not worry about the trail. You can't feel it. Um, and those two things go directly in the face of each other. You can't have a very stiff bike and not feel the trail, right? Um, so, i.e. 35 millimeter handlebars versus the 31.8, you know, and we came from like, what was it? I don't know, 28.1 or something like that. So handlebars have gotten thicker, but I think if you look at most companies, they've settled back at 31.8 because they realize that little bit of give combined with carbon is the best combination to, you know, kill that chattery sensation. So with carbon coming out from aluminum, mm -hmm. really kind of changed the, the, the game as far as like the frame design, instead of it just being like tubular, it's square. If it's evil, it's like, yeah, go ahead and just press this through a Play-Doh machine and that's what you get. And how does that affect you as a designer for trying to, to like, like make the graphics for these bikes? Well, again, I work with the companies and so they give me the graphics, right? I, I'm not, I'm not sitting there trying to trace out the graphics um, and recreate, you know, recreate the wheel, so to speak. Um, in, now there are times. In some cases you do though, like if it's an older bike or something that yeah. maybe they're giving you the graphics, but you have a, an agreement with them. Yeah. At that point, like, how, how do you, I'm sorry, I'm getting off from my original question, but I think it, 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 it's a good thing to talk about is how do you get then that for the person who's trying to order the stickers from you? It's kind of like, uh, it, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty vacuous, man. It's, it's, it's sometimes I'm spot on and people are like, wow, you did that really well. And then sometimes even with all the best measurements and whatnot, I send it to them and they're like, this is way off. Um, it's very hard, especially when I don't have the tangible product in my hands to do it myself. You know, I'm, I'm relying on somebody to give me measurements and I can give the best directions I think I can. And I'm like, hey, here's everything. Uh, ooh, nice package, tuck in the edges, tape, you know, a little bow. And what they give me back is not what I needed or maybe it's a little off. And and that's, that's no fault of, of the people that I work with. Um, because ultimately, so you're asking them, like, if, if you have, if they have a bike, maybe that you, you don't have the graphics for, mm -hmm. they need to know, like, the width of the font and the height of the font. Right. And then that gives you, then, you know, oh, I can use the same <laughs> font style that they have. Right. But you make it this size. Yeah. Well, I mean, and here's the thing, right? Like, within graphic design, a company will do what's called kerning, which is reducing or increasing the space in between letters to reduce visual discrepancies between letters. So like if you take a T, which has a bunch of space in between and put it next to an H, now you have this big empty space of square. And then next to the H, maybe you put an L, right? So the H and the L are butt way together. And that space now feels smaller than the space next to it, right? And then the L has that big square over there. Whatever you put over there, there's this big space. So visually it looks stretched out and ill-spaced. And so Kerning allows you to move the letters a little bit to try and visually space the letters out so that they flow and there's no hangups within the lettering, right? And that's part of being a graphic designer. And so companies do that. And so whenever I go and just kind of use a general font or whatever, I'm guessing at what they're doing, you know? I mean, I'll, I'll go and do searches and- So that makes sense. Then. So that's why maybe you could print it out and it, with your letter space thing, it's, it's actually not the same. So that would be- right. And you're trying to ask somebody a layman like me i'm the fucking i'm just drinking beer in my garage i'm like yeah so you actually need to know the spaces in between the letters as well and it's not like yeah. they can picture and be like oh here you go like i mean i that's that more often than not that's the uh that's the response i get they're like here's a picture i'm like thank you so if they took like a feet measure and and spread it or a yardstick and like put it out on top of the 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 graphic I took a picture of it that, that would probably get you a lot a lot better yes but the problem with taking a picture is you have to realize there's some lens distortion within cameras and all cameras have a different lens distortion and so at the edge of pictures sometimes it bulges at the inside of pictures sometimes it bulges changes shape if you're not shooting it directly on you know there's dude, there's so many variables in that instance um you know and i try to account for them but it is what it is you know, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a necessary evil that I have to deal with within what I'm doing. So basically, the moral of the story is that if you're getting graphics that you don't have the design for, there's a little bit of back and forth, and and maybe the first yes. set somebody gets 
isn't isn't right. Yeah, there's that. I mean, and even within graphics that I get from some of the companies, um, you know, most most bike companies don't design graphics for each size of bike. So what they'll do is they'll go, okay, here's our medium bike, and uh, they'll send that overseas, and then the company that produces the frames adjusts the graphics, right? And some companies adjust graphics better than others. Some just stretch it. Some like some will actually resize it officially. Um, so it runs the gamut, right? So you got somebody on that end that may or may not know how to be graphically oriented. Um, so <clears throat> sometimes stuff's off. And you know, I, I try to work with the companies to keep that uh, you know mitigated. But in the end, sometimes it just doesn't work. I was gonna ask you that. So the graphics are, they actually change sizes for the frames? It's not- uh, this Not every company. For instance, uh, Santa Cruz doesn't do that. Um, you know, uh, Specialized does, Ibis does, Norco does, um, Canfield does, uh, several other companies as well. Um, and obviously, you know, wheel, wheel companies do the same, you know, different size wheels has different size graphics, so. I think that was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about on here that from me working with you over time that I, I really um, was kind of surprised about was the colors and how they they play out because basically you can't print every color that we can see, right? Right. And like a digital color, which would be, and I'll let you get into this for, for the, the layman's out there, like most people when they're designing like if i'm making a, a a logo for my website i'm using what's called rgb right but print typically uses cmyk right correct and rgb what, what does rgb stand for that stands for red green and blue and those are the three wet light wavelengths that a computer screen uses to create all the colors you see on a screen um and it actually is stepped in 256 increments and so basically what you're seeing is the darker a color is, the less amount of steps you're seeing. And then if you have your red, your green, and your blue in 256 points of concentration, you get white. Now, going the other way, ink starts off at zero, which is white. And as you add the 100% on cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, you get technically black. But inks aren't 100%. Um, the C M Y K. So yeah. C cyan. What cyan? What color is that? Cyan's a. It's kind of a light, light blue, but it's intense. Okay. Um, the M is magenta. That's a reddish. It's it's kind of a, a hot pink almost. Yeah, and then yet Y is yellow. Yellow. And, and then K the is K, black. K is black. That makes Correct. a lot of sense. Well, I think it comes down to they didn't want people to get confused and think it was blue, so they did the K, wow. which is the last letter of black. Um, I'm not entirely like, sure about that. <laughs> so I think you have a graphic that we talked about earlier that kind of shows that and and why you run into some problems with mm -hmm. the the bikes. Yeah. yeah, I can show you a couple things. Um, so this is probably the, the easiest to understand right here. And so the big area on the outside is what we call the visible spectrum. Everything that people's eyes can see, that's what's available in terms of our visual perception. Now, if you look closely here, you'll see a yellow triangle, and that is your RGB, which is your screen color. So you've got your green, got your blue, you've got your red, and as they get more intense, they come together to form the white right here. Now, if you look even closer, there's a black area. That black area is the CMYK possibilities. So anything outside of that black circle. So, just a second. so, just, so basically, for those of you guys that are maybe just driving along listening to this on your drive the visible spectrum looks like a kind of fucked up triangle that's really big right. and then inside of that is a regular triangle which is missing a shit ton of colors and then it's probably missing half the colors <laughs> right. then the the black area that he's talking about is basically like a circle that doesn't encompass the entire triangle so then right. you have all the spots in the circle that are outside of the triangle that are not RGB. So when somebody's seeing that on their computer screen, that color actually can't be, or I'm sorry, the CMYK can't be rep represented on the computer screen. And then vice versa, 
if it's outside of that circle, it can't be represented by a printed color at all. Uh, not really, no. And sometimes I can I can do some fudging. I mean, I'm I'm pretty good with that. Um, you know, like I said, I've got I've got about 12 years of print experience, um, so I, I'm able to do some color testing and get close. Um, but that you know that takes time and that takes money. So if you know you're really adamant about a color, you're gonna you're gonna have to pay a little bit extra to get the exact color you want, or at least as close as we can. You know. You want to know something funny? I do. Those of you guys that don't, uh, Rich, Richard's been to my house a bunch of times. My dog does not like Richard for some reason. <laughs> and here's my voice, and he's growling. <laughs> he just came out in the backyard, and he started barking. He's like, "Where the fuck is that?" <laughs> Look at me. I'm your captain now. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just I heard him come out and I was like, motherfucker. He's like, oh, there's Richard. I'm gonna bark out. So getting getting back to it. So do the the bike company, so so you just talked to me about the difference of because sometimes like maybe I design something or somebody sends you like a graphic and they want that exact color, and maybe because the way CMYK is doesn't represent it exactly right. Mm -hmm. So then there's also some other issues from what you had told me with printing as well that like printers do when when like santa cruz like picks a color for their bike mm -hmm. that's a paint color not a print color so right. does that then end up being something that is not even being able to be printed so when well, you so somebody would be like oh okay they have the teal um santa cruz that i have and they're like i want this to be gone you know, or this part to be like the exact same color. You can't match that paint exactly then, can you? No, no. Um, so, so when they're choosing those paint colors with like, they're not choosing colors that are in that spectrum of printing range always. No, so um, going back to this graphic right here, the way the, the way the print and paint industry gets around this is they actually create what's called a Pantone scale. And the Pantone scale, extends color past the normal range of a CMYK printer. Um, and Pantone is only good if you're using what's called a plate printer, okay? And a plate printer basically is, if you can imagine these big towers and they have this plate. Wait, you have a picture. I do, I do. And here, let me, let me show it to you. Okay, so if you look here, you can see this. This thing's about 60 feet long by about 10 feet wide. They're gigantic. This is a plate printer. And each one of these different towers has cyan, magenta, yellow, black. And then usually there's another tower here that will run a fifth color that can be your Pantone color, right? So if you have an absolutely specific color you need to run, this is your Pantone color. Now, you can see this is kind of modular, so you can actually add different towers. So that Pantone color is like a special witch's brew mix color that you're Correct, running. correct, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, okay. And then so, you know, a lot of people also ask like, hey, can I do a, a gloss and matte uh, decal? And the reason I can't do that is because I'm printing on one sheet and then I do a laminate, which is a sheet laminate. So it's actually a piece of vinyl that I'm putting over the top um, and it's one, one color. Whereas when they get these decals printed by these machines, what they'll do is one of those towers actually has um, a gloss or a matte or a satin and that's how they get that, that dual effect of, of gloss and matte. Now I am looking into doing some different techniques by using some templates to create a matte gloss effect. And I have some success, but I have to figure out the best way to use some like spray templates to get it really dialed and looking professional. I'm, I'm at about 80% right now. So you don't have the 60 foot printer. You have a not. different printer. Correct. That, that one looks a lot like your, your home printer. Um, this, this is the exact model I have. This is the HP Latex 360. And it's basically, I mean, if you, if you opened up your house printer, it would have a cyan, a magenta, a yellow, and a black cartridge. And that little head moves back and forth. And as that head moves back and forth, it basically acts like a little micro spray paint can and sprays the dots where it needs to go, right? This is just a giant version that works on a 60-inch sheet of vinyl. And it has a much higher DPI. So, so the way that your stickers are printed is they come out of that machine. Correct. And then... That's just like a regular piece of paper. Yeah, technically, it's just like what you would print on your your home printer, right? And then you put some plastic on top of it. Yeah, 
basically I, well, it's, it's, it's a lamination film and it's uh -huh. the same size. And I run it through these two big rollers that basically smash it together. And then I, I can offer uh, a gloss, a matte, a satin. There's some other things out there in the world. They've got some uh, like metallic covers. They've got some. Uh, does it have like an adhesive on it or does it just yeah, like. That on the bottom side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does that adhesive like mess up the colors at all? Um, so when you add gloss uh, laminate, you do get a little bit of color darkening. It tends to make the color look a little bit more vibrant, a little darker. Um, the satin is probably the least intrusive in terms of like color variation. And then the matte will dull the color slightly. So basically you go through all this fucking shit show of a process to get a color right. And then you print it. And then that's like a little bit of a dice roll too then. Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, dude, color is the most frustrating. And here's the other thing too, from, you know, I use several different materials and each, each different material uh, ranges in it in terms of its pure white state, what I, which I print on. So you get some that looks almost very light gray and some that looks super bright white. And each different material has what's called a printer profile. And that profile is basically the company who produced the vinyl says, hey, this is the best color trueness we've found to be um, accurate for this material. And sometimes I go in and I change the profiles myself, make a custom profile. But 99% of the time, the profiles themselves are, are they're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. So getting back to what we were talking about earlier about the frames being like all these funky sizes and weird shapes and stuff, like are those like fonts and stuff kind of distorted to work around those corners or they're like they're crisp in the way that they are and then they just lay on the frame that way? Man, it, it, it runs the gamut. That's a... That's a trick question almost, you know, <laughs> um, so it sometimes, depends, depends sometimes on the, I get, say it again. So it depends on the vendor. Sometimes it depends on the vendor. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the smaller companies don't have, you know, the best designers who, who, uh, work within the kind of graphic standards of the industry. Um, and then you have like some of the larger companies who have their shit dialed and it's fucking perfect, you know, so, uh, like on a Santa Cruz bike for or whatever bike, like the big name bike bikes, are those those aren't like stickers that I can just like peel off, right? No, most so, of the time, the stuff you see on bikes is what's called a water decal, and uh, it's a really thin. Um, almost, so like they'll they'll stick this stuff into water, and it basically turns it into almost a gel layer. It's super thin, and then they put it on there, and then they squeegee it on, and then they pull away the backing, and it leaves the graphic. They dry that and then they clear coat over it. So they clear coat over it. So it's not yeah. like you can go out there and get a, a carbon or even an aluminum bike and just kind of get those stickers off because the, the the clear coat's on there on top of them. Correct. So my solution to that is I usually make graphics that are supposed to cover current graphics about a millimeter wider all the way around so that you have a slight tiny bit of way to play with it. And then also realize that the, the, the good thing about vinyl is it's highly, highly elastic. Um, so if you start to put it down and you notice like, oh shit, it's it's just a tad too small. If you take a hair dryer and heat it for about 10 seconds, you'll be able to pull it over just a little bit to fit it. Um, and it's very forgiving material, you know? That's, so, why we, that's why we like it. So customizing your bike, you know, which which I've done, done or you've done to mine, like yep. it make, makes it look totally fucking different and, and def definitely like unique to you. Right. But there's also some properties to it that, you know, I didn't think about whenever I first did it. Like you did a down tube sticker for me. Mm -hmm. and that, that's actually like really a, a protective layer for like when I'm shuttling and stuff like that. Do you have anything that you do other like is like, do you do like a thicker material for that or do you have no or, or a product that you do for just for protect protection? You know, we've been looking into protective stuff, and I've actually, um, I've actually been talking with the Ibis guys and working on some protective uh, layering, like super custom, you know, per bike, per size. And unfortunately, right now, the logistics aspect of it just doesn't pan out. Um, I mean, because I'm talking about, even if you're talking about 40, 50 frames a year, you're still talking about three to four to five sizes per frame, right? 
and I've got to put the R&D time in to do that. And then who knows if people are going to buy it, right? So currently it's not, uh, it's not feasible. All right. That's not to say that we won't do it. Um, we are looking into some more generic style um, protection. But, you know, that wasn't that wasn't the main idea of, of the company originally. But we do get asked that quite often. So it, it's it's on our radar. So one of the other things that I, I think I, I need to break up or mention, and I think this is a touchy subject, is not everything you can do is on your site, right? Correct. Um, you know, the site is for what I call participating partners. And uh, if people want things that I don't have, send me an email. We can probably figure it out, build it for you, do what you need, um, get it done. You know? Okay. So, so the, the, the moral of that story is if you go to the website and you don't see something that you need, send him an email and, and he should be able to work with you. Eyes wide shut. Right. With, with, within the legal parameters of the world. Correct. <laughs> we'll, we'll just say it like that. So yes. what is like uh, some of your favorite designs that you've done so far? Wow. Um, you know, I am a pretty simple guy in terms of what I like. Um, I don't really like the loud and crazy, even though my bike, I kind of went crazy with it. And I did this, uh, I call it my like dad brand Ripley. And I did some, uh, did some basically like Hawaiian style floral prints on it. <clears throat> and I thought it was going to actually be really, you know, gaudy, obnoxious. And the point of it was to start conversations with people out on the trail. But in the end, it actually ended up looking pretty cool. And it wasn't as like murderously overt as I thought it was going to be. Um, so that was kind of one of the crazier ones I've done. Um, I gotta say a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, camo ones have been really cool. Um, I work really closely with fanatic bike shop. They order quite a bit of decals from me. I do quite a bit of custom decal work for them. Um, if you guys haven't heard of them, they're a bike shop out of Bellingham that does a, a crap ton of custom and they're, they're fantastic. Um, the guys that, uh, watch, uh, Daily MTB rider, he, he works with them pretty pretty closely too. Yeah, yeah. So they've been a big supporter of mine, gotten the name out there for me. They push people to me when they don't want to deal with the custom aspect that, you know, they, they don't want to play telephone. They're like, hey, go to the source, you know? Um, so that's been good. I've, I, I've got a lot of shops that use me regularly. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm starting to do a little bit more business with Wrench Science out of like Berkeley area. Um, worldwide uses me. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about some stuff that we've talked about that's in the future potentially. Yeah, you know, like upsell something. I'm going to put you on a fucking time frame. No, um, like <coughs> some of the things that we talked about, like you know, just in, in our casual conversations that I thought were really interesting was like you were thinking about potentially getting to a point where, like, you could put a, a something into a bike shop and then people would be able to go in there and just pick different colors and. Oh yeah, man. I've got, I've got so many ideas, you know, um, all the ideas. Well, you know, so I, I have a mentor who's really high up in the bike industry and I'm going to, I'm going to leave him nameless right now, but we, we talk often, you know, and he kind of helps ground me because I, I've got kind of a, you know, idea ADD almost. And so at one of his best sayings that he said to me was, <clears throat> you know, you have a hundred ideas, choose two, Richard, choose fucking two, you know? And, right at the time it didn't really like sink in and solidify. And, and then when it did, I was just like, I, I get it. Right. Like you can only probably work on two things and fully commit yourself to that on top of maintaining, you know, the, the influx of, of customers that I have um, being that I'm a pretty small company with like three dudes, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, I do have a lot of ideas and I don't want to throw them out there and get people super excited because some of them may come to fruition. Some of them may not. But the first thing that will come up on the site is um, I will be adding bike colorways to the site so that they will be certified um, to be as close as possible that we can get to. And you don't have to guess and just go, hey, that, that color third over from the right and four down, that looks like my, my bike. Um, you'll be able to go in and go, this is my, you know, this is my Yeti vitamin P, like my bike back there. You'll know that's the color. Um, and then one of the other options will be we're probably going to pare down the offerings and offer colors up front. So if you click on vitamin P Ripley, 
there'll be three different versions right there ready to rock and roll, right? And you're like, ah, that's the one I want. Um, <clears throat> and then what we'd like to do too is, is get a little deeper in terms of at least understanding you know, the parts that come on bikes. So if you, if you go and get this Ripley, right, and you bought the whole bike, chances are if you bought it, it's got a Fox fork and it's got a Fox shock on it, right? And so it'll be like, hey, you, you got the Fox fork in the, this color. Is this the shock you want? Are these the wheels you want? And it'll all be right there. And, and then hopefully what I can do is offer a better pricing package deal. And it's a lot easier for you to buy it all at once, you know? So, so one thing I want to clear up for people, because unfortunately, like my my relationship with you is not exactly the same as, as a, a regular consumer, because the, the way that we've been working together. But um, and I want to make sure that people understand this. Like there is a difference in saying, hey, I want the Santa Cruz graphics in pink instead of in orange. But instead I want, you know, you to murder some shit out for me right. and uh, put some, some like some, some bike cogs in the back of my icons and this and that there's, there's a design fee, right? Correct. Um, so what I've done is uh, design time currently is a hundred dollars an hour, but I've broken that out into quarter hour increments. So basically 25 bucks, and 99% of the designs that I do, as long as people aren't super choosy or picky, can be done in a quarter hour, right? Yeah. Basically, and, it's a quarter hour for everybody except for me because uh, Richard yeah. and I, we go back and forth all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've almost gotten to the point where I'm going to charge Robert double. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. so so people have an idea, like what's a fork cost? Like if I just want graphics for my rock sock, shocks, what's that? Um, forks run 35. Um, some are a little bit more. Uh, so there's the one that's a little bit more is the uh, Manitou Dorado because it uses more material, therefore more cost. And then there is an upcharge for uh, metallic material because it is a, I mean, the cost for me to buy a roll of metallic material is literally like three times that of me buying um, a regular roll of vinyl. So it's probably like forty to sixty bucks, something like that, for a fork. No, it's 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 between thirty-five and forty-five. Oh, okay. So it's not that bad then. No. So then, as far as like, if somebody well, then what's like, if somebody wants to get their forks, their wheels, and their frame done with a color that is just different than the 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 vent, like the way it came, like. Right. What, something like that cost that ranges i mean wheel decals vary in size greatly you know um some take up a square foot of material some take up four square feet of material so wheel decals run from about 25 to 75 um forks are maintain uh the same price approximately uh shocks same thing um <clears throat> so i mean you, you, frames range from you know 25 bucks all the way up to 75 bucks on frames so you're probably and about so, 500 bucks or less to get your whole bike oh. done. Oh, absolutely. I mean, most, most, even if I charge you full pop on stuff with some design time, you're only looking at about 300 bucks. Um, but what I'd like to do is if people are interested in putting together a full bike like that, I usually offer a pretty good discount. You know, I take 25% off of your order, frame, fork, shock, wheel set, that kind of stuff. So I'll work with you, you know. The 300 ish range is about what it costs then to get your bike done up. A full bike, yeah, full blown. Bike. But just like the basic colors from like, or just changing colors. Like, so then if you want to get funky in your design, then you're adding some design time on it. Maybe that costs you another hundred bucks. Um, I'd still say that falls under 300 unless you're getting super complex. You oh, know? wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I had, I had a guy, I had a guy that wanted some uh, decals for a bike and he wanted like, crazy zombies all over it, you know? And I ended up being about 450 bucks, but that was because I had to like find files, create files, lay it all out in there, change the colors, overlap them, cut it out. <clears throat> so, you know, it, it takes time. I think I think that's fair. I mean, for, for what you're getting, something that's completely customized, like completely customized compared to, you know, the, the way that it shipped. I know, for example, like Moonlight Leatherfoot bought that new bronze or last year's Bronson, he loves the color of the bike, but all the fonts are red. So he's like, oh, I want to do something different. So I think for that extra amount, like what you get, in my opinion, I think I, I personally feel like that's worth it. 
Maybe other people don't, but I, I, I feel like it is personally. So you know, and I, and I really want to point out that uh, I'm I'm really trying to work within the industry and with the brands, and you know, I'm building a brand here. So if somebody was to take my intellectual property and start using it somewhere else, you know, I worked hard to create what I have. So I respect that coming from these these companies. So I really want to work with them, you know. And there's no other company out there that's trying to do it the way I'm doing. So you know, when you support some of these other guys, you know, basically you're buying the counterfeit Louis Vuitton, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Right. So, so um, two things I want to say for those of you guys watching, think of some questions because we are going to take some live questions. I didn't do that last week, but I, I want to incorporate that into into the live stream. Going forward, I, I'm just trying to figure this out as I go along. Um, but one of the things that I do want to talk to you about is application. So tell me, like, what it is that people need to know. Like, yeah, how, does that the bike have to be like? If you fuck up putting it on, is the sticker done? Like th those kind of things. So great question, man. Um, I get a lot of those, and so if I can, if I can, kind of. Uh, dispel some of the worries that people have, <clears throat> you know, in a, in a group, the better. Uh, so number one, the material that we use, I probably went through about 50 different materials trying to find the one that to me encompass uh, qualities that were good for people that were not versed in putting vinyl onto a surface, i.e. it didn't stretch really easily. <clears throat> it wasn't a super, super tacky initial put down. Um, and B, it's a dur you know, C, it's a durable material. So uh, what I mean by that is this vinyl is a little bit thicker, so it doesn't stretch quite as easily right off the bat. And uh, <clears throat> but it does actually have like you told me it has like little microscopic holes in it, though, right? Yeah. So that's an air release material, and that basically allows for even if you get a bubble in there, if you just leave it alone and hit it with some heat, the material will actually shrink back down and push the air out. So um, that's one of the qualities we really liked. Number one, but number two. The material that we use has what's called an initial tack and that initial tack is a lighter adhesive quality than its full initial or its full uh adhesion and that's achieved through it's got a it's kind of two layers of of, of um, adhesion and that second one is activated by heat and rubbing right so what i recommend to people to do is get your stuff into place first and you can pull it up as many times as you need and if you if you bend it out of place a little bit, get, hit it with a hairdryer, and that'll basically bring it back to um, its original shape. Um, and then once you have it in place and you're happy with the placement, <clears throat> hit it with the hairdryer, which will shrink it down, which and also it'll basically activate these other little microscopic bubbles of secondary adhesive, kind of like an epoxy. It's a two-step, right? And then you burnish it down, meaning giving it a good rub, and uh, that really sets it. And then if you have the uh luxury of not riding your bike for 24 hours after application that's best case scenario um so i know like when people like get their windows tinted uh -huh. got to kind of spray like a soapy water on it first and then they put the sticker down you don't yeah, want to do that but I, I you know this stuff's so forgiving and bike bike decals are so much smaller than you know windows or moto decals or or car wraps or anything like that you're going to be you're going to be struggling a little bit more if you if you add that because you're going to be trying to squeegee it out and then it's going to move. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, if you have experience using that type of application, then absolutely go for it. Um, you know, I include instructions with um, with all my shipments, and uh, we're looking to do some really kind of cool videos to help show how to take how to how to put it on. Um, and I'm actually looking at hopefully including an alcohol cleaning spray and a squeegee soon with like orders over say 50 bucks. So, so. and the other thing that people need to know, um, these stickers aren't like you peel them off a piece of paper and stick them on there. It's a two part, right? Well, it depends. It depends. I mean, some decals. Okay. So we have what's called a single decal, which you can peel off and put on, or you have what's called a, like a, like a, a rim or something like that. Right. Okay, what do you mean? A rim, like a rim, like an NB sticker is just one big sticker. So you right, probably right. pull that off and stick it on. Correct. But when you have letters that are like saying it's Santa, cut out. then that's well, on a 
two part, right? Right. So, so what you have is what's called a release paper, and that has a tack that is stickier than the vinyl to the kind of plasticized backing. And so you pull that ta uh, application paper back, and your decals are stuck on that. You, you pull the back of it off, and now you have a piece of paper with all the stickers stuck on it, but that's right. still you, and then yeah. you stick that on the frame. Right, and then you give that a rub, and then you can peel off the application paper, and that leaves the decals on the frame. Um, at that point, if something's not lined up right, then that's where you kind of go back and like individually yeah. read or something like that. Yeah, and I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. What I usually do is I take a little piece of painter's tape if I'm doing lettering, and I'll put it about a millimeter away from the the lettering, and I'll do each letter individually. It takes more time, but in the end, you're probably going to be happier with the uh, with the outcome. Oh, okay. But you still use the release paper, though. You like just cut the, each letter out and then do it. Correct. Right. Correct. That makes sense. Yeah. What What is like the time? that it probably takes to do a frame, like if you're doing. If you're I mean, if you got a clean frame, I mean, you could probably get it done in an hour, hour and a half. You got to clean the frame. You're looking at three hours probably for like a full, like fork, shock, wheels, and frame, about three hours. Right on. So um, stepping away from, from the product again and just like, where is it that you want to see like, sticker getting to like what is some of like like how do you want to see this company grow man again 100 ideas choose two right that's that's where i'm kind of at right now um <clears throat> i'm actually looking at possibly white labeling the site right so i'd be able to create widgets that i give to the companies that i work with that basically installs a stickered like application in their site and people can customize their shit on the spot Right, you buy the bike, you customize the decals. You buy the fork, you customize the decals. Of course, I print them. I can either ship them to them; they can put them on, or I can ship them to the person who bought them. They put them on. Um, well, that'd be pretty sick. You go to the shop, you're like, I fucking hate the red letters. I want this with the pink letters. And why do I keep saying pink today? I don't know. Got pink on the brain. Um, the flavor of your favorite color. Right. <laughs> I can go down that rabbit hole. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> This thing on hello be here all week <laughs> so um what is um something that like makes you excited about where the company is going right now um well you know beforehand you know the, the company's been around for about three and a half years um in some capacity or another and <clears throat> it was literally just us trying to chase everybody and their mother down and now I've got some of the big companies coming to me, you know? So <clears throat> I feel like maybe that says, hey, you've kind of arrived, right? Like right now I'm, I'm working with Norco to become part of their custom bike builder on their site, you know? And that's a, I mean, Norco is basically the specialized of fucking Canada, eh? Right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, subtle humor. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's you know, I, I get emails like that all the time, you know? Uh, you know, I just picked up stands not too long ago, so they'll be on the site soon. Um, I, I'm working more with uh, Industry Nine; they've been a great customer. I got to get more of their stuff on the site. Um, you know, I've got Manitou on board. I got to get a bunch of their stuff on the site. Um, you know, with, with Derby and Knight and uh, Project Three Two One Two, so some smaller companies as well, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so I mean, not to say that that was kind of the plan to draw the bigger fish in, but. Originally, we we're like, you know what? These smaller companies can't keep up in terms of colorways, and can't keep keep up in terms of like having all of these decals always readily available. I mean, <clears throat> just to have and stock and reorder and you know plan for having these decals. That's that's a you're talking about thousands of dollars in product that may or may not sell, and you're talking about probably a full time position of somebody you're paying forty five k a year, right? So these small companies simply don't have the bandwidth and the money to do it. Um, and that's where a lot of them were just like, this is brilliant. Let's do it. Help us out. You know? So, and I think you've done some stuff too, that I thought was pretty cool. Um, even outside of the bike that I, that I never would have really thought of. Like I've seen you do graphics like for helmets as well. Like where yeah. you're adding some customization to a helmet or, you know, something like that, where like 
you can actually even like make yourself look pretty kitted compared to you know the the, the guy next to you and and it's really just throwing some stickers on there yeah um you know your your helmet sponsor cali um i work pretty closely with those guys uh been a huge fan of their product forever um pl not to mention the dudes over there just down to earth treated me really well um <clears throat> but you I know i've been day and I, I have to interject this right now like um somebody was telling me that they were trying to get some strike or they got some strikes and either something was wrong with them or they some something was messed up i can't remember what the deal was right and they oh the sizing wasn't right right so they got the wrong size and the right size that he needed was they were out of stock on right and they actually sent him the right or they they sent him a whole different knee pad and we're like look you take these and you ride with these until we can tell and we'll send you the right ones and, okay. and the way that i responded back to him was like look i'm telling you out of every company and I, I haven't done business with a lot of company in my channel yet but out of all the companies that i've worked with so far they are hands down like like they are fucking legitimately taking care of their customers like and i'm not saying that you're fucked up but those guys man they really like they're squared away, man. <laughs> yeah, no, they are absolutely, man. Um, and and you know, I'm actually working with them right now on helping them out with some some graphic design and some like pop display stuff and some of their messaging. Um, and uh, but anyway, I've also been working with them to create some online helmet graphics that just like the forks and the shocks, you'll be able to click and color, and you'll get this kit to install. So if you're like a BMX rider or you're a team rider, you put your colors on there. You can send us your logo. We'll slap that in there. You can send us your rider names. We'll slap that in there. And it's going to be just this really cool, easy experience, hopefully. I mean, that's that's the idea behind it. <clears throat> I had a really good question, but I forgot it. Yeah. It's in the, it's in the beer fridge. <laughs> <laughs> All I got to do is just reach in here for another question. A lot of question. So, um, what the hell was it I was going to ask you? Right? So, Richard, how do people get a hold of you? Um, you can either go to the site and basically hit the uh, inquiry button, which will send an email to our general info line, which is info at sticker.com, or you can email me directly at richard at sticker.com. Uh, it's as simple as that. That's so weird because I found you on Tinder. So. Yeah. <laughs> you mean Grinder, right? <laughs> <laughs> or what was Grinder? Was it? Uh, I forgot. Yeah, we were sitting there and doing footstall signals underneath the bathroom stalls and the trucker stop. Yeah, that was us. So apparently Richard has a little bit of a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. So um, I was going to say as well, like, so uh, outside of bikes and mm -hmm. you also do like logo design and stuff like that too, right? I do, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been a graphic designer now for... I mean, professionally, you know, after college and whatnot, I've been for 15 years now. Um, I've worked for uh, my first company was Expedia and I worked with them. I was a you know general designer, did a lot of in-house stuff. And then I became part of the web team, did a lot of user interface design, user experience design. And then I became the global manager of visual design for Rocktape, which sounds really uh, sexy, but basically was a made up title that I gave myself because the boss said, what do you want to be called? And I said, global manager of visual design. He goes, that sounds good. So but what I did with them is you know, that's actually the same title that I told uh, Katie to refer to me as because <laughs> I'm definitely a global manager of visual design. <laughs> that, that is a svelte model right there. What do you call that? Oh, this, 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 this shit's on point, man. It's, it's the all the sex model. <laughs> <laughs> or the lack thereof. I don't know, whatever it is. So, um, he has thumbs model. That's what this is. Right. I'm sorry. What was that? Mumbles. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> we do have to sidestep just just a hair. So um, you will do like stickers for channels or like oh, yeah. somebody that just wants to like put some stickers on for their their like their their car club or something oh, like yeah. that. You know? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've, I've designed logos for about two or three dudes that have YouTube channels. Um, I've done stickers for probably 10 times as many of those. Um, we do vehicle wraps. 
we do. Um, I actually have a friend who opened up a bagel bar just recently here in Campbell, California. Um, I did her logo. I did uh, window decals. I did this cool little project where she asked me for some stickers to uh, include with uh, one of those those Thera flasks, you know, so you could put the stickers on there. Um, I helped her with their menus. I mean, it runs the gamut, man. I, I really have and can do it all. I've got vendors for everything. Um, you know, so what would be the reason that, from your perspective, why somebody would want to come to you and not maybe print through like sticker meal or something like that? Well, that's a great question. Uh, sticker mule, and I, I'm going to have to take this back to you know customer right. service and personal touch, right. really. I mean, we're sticker somebody, not yeah. sticker. We're, we're not calling out any brands, but if there sticker was donkey out there and, uh, and and we were trying to say not to use them but to use you who would that company be look man i'm i'm not going to sit here and blow smoke at these these wow. people you know <laughs> sticker mule is a, a legit company they make a great product and they're easy to deal with now however if you're un uh inexperienced in the ways of making stickers you might send them a file and get it back and it looks like shit because they don't care they're a turn and burn company right me, you're going to send me something and I'm going to send you a, a proof and you're going to say, yes, that's it. Or no, it's not. We're going to work together and we're going to get you what you want. Um, and so I think there's a little bit more of a uh, hand holding and a personal touch and just a little bit higher level of customer service on my end. I mean, yeah, they've got a really great glamorized checkout system on, online. You can just sit there and do. But again, you know, ordering stickers for the first time, if you're going to drop a, a wad of cash, can be it can be scary, right? Especially if you – I just had a friend of mine. She called me up. She owns a hair salon. She goes, I got these stickers. They fucking suck. Can you help me? And I said, yeah, I can help you. So, I mean, that's one story off the bat that I can think of amongst a sea of many. So, ultimately, what your your business, though, your core business is taking care of us us bike riders. You don't yeah. sell any, any stickers to, like, roadies, do you? To who? Roadies. Oh, yeah, no, I got roadies is is becoming fast uh, a large part of it. Um, you know, I work with Specialized and I do a lot of road bikes. I do a ton of road wheels. I do a ton of cross wheels as well. Um, you know, and and I think you know road bikers like to look pretty, just like us mountain bikers do. You know, I think they do a little bit more than us, actually. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, they look better in tight clothes. Let's be honest. You know. I, <laughs> Not us big guys, though. We don't look no. good. God, we look like a sausage casing. <laughs> let, let, let's get back to you riding, dude. Where, where do you ride at? Um, you know, I'm blessed to live in an area where I can ride 11 months out of the year, maybe 12 if you don't mind a little slop. Um, but I live right next to Santa Cruz, California. Um, some of the best riding in the world, I say. And on top of that, you know, if I'm going for a quick go-to, I'm here in San Jose. I've got, I've got uh, Santa Teresa Park. Ride that one legit trail in UC, and that's it, right? What's that? You yeah, I ride, so I go up Pogo Nip and then I ride the fire road, uh, two green gates, and then ride back down Pogo Nip. It's, uh, it's thrilling. It really is. Oh, riveting. If, if you have somebody, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I walk sections. I am a fat kid. I have no shame. <laughs> um, what's, what's your what's your favorite ride you've ever done, dude? Um, I mean, I'm you know it's cliche, but Whistler, dude, Whistler's fucking fantastic. If you haven't been there, it'll. It'll change your life. I mean, you'll advance your skills. You know, if you ride four or five days in Whistler, you become twice the rider you were before. You'll do stuff that scared the shit out of you before, and it becomes kind of part of your repertoire. Um, <clears throat> and just the culture up there is fucking fantastic, too. You went down to Rampage, too, too in the past, didn't you? I did. I did. Yeah, no, that was fucking fantastic. I did that in about 2012. Um, I got to ride with some big name pros. Uh, and I also got to meet the Canfield brothers who make fucking fantastic bikes as well. Um, and you know, I was jumping off the edges of cliffs and doing jumps that I didn't think I would do, but the stoke level there was so fucking giant that like what was, what was out of my range became like the norm across the plate. Like everybody was doing it, you know? So that was super cool. If you guys can get out to, to rampage, I'd highly recommend it. Fantastic. Is that, that's open to the public? It is. Oh, I didn't they've, know that. they've changed they've changed the ticketing structure now i don't know how it goes now but like the tickets sold out in like an hour this last year but when i went dude you could roll up to the gate buy a ticket you could camp anywhere you know like just pull off the side of the road and camp and then the old rampage site across from the new rampage site was open and dudes were fucking you know shuttling up to the top 
bike hiking up to the top and just throwing down big, man. It was cool. What, 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 what was like the most shocking thing to you? Like probably the, the features just, they're just in, insane or. Oh yeah. I mean, you see it on TV and yeah, it looks giant because you're looking at this little ant hugging off the side of the cliff, but these, these trails, these guys are riding you were literally like allowed to stand a foot away from these fucking cliffs they're hucking off of. So I'm standing at the edge of this 50 foot cliff with a 70 foot gap to the landing. And here comes like Cam McCall or here comes uh, Cam Zink. Boom, backflip off this thing. Like his handlebar, I could have reached out and touched his handlebar, you know? Um, it was insane. And then just to be there in person and realize how big it was. I mean, it's a whole nother level, dude. What have you, um, what, like before you started working with the bike industry, like, is there anything about the bike industry that like took you by surprise that you didn't expect before you were working in it? No, it's just like any other corporate world, you know. Um, I've I've found there's about a two year process of acceptance to anything new. Um, when I bring new ideas to the table, when I was at Expedia, it took about two years to get my idea up and running to fruition and at at a, at a you know optimal level of of operation. And it's, it's kind of been the same thing within the bike industry. It's getting that acceptance, right? And and that acceptance is gained through, you know, at first it was built on the backs of the smaller companies. Um, and then the bigger ones came along and the bigger ones and the bigger ones. It's kind of, you know, pyramid in shape, if you will. Um, you know, there's still a couple of key players missing that <clears throat> I don't know if they'll ever say yes, you know. Um, but hopefully they see the light, you know, and hopefully some of my new product offerings and some of my new web offerings will sway them in the right direction you know what's your uh, what's your favorite kind of riding i again riding in santa cruz i mean it's i like good chunky steep gnar i'm not really a flow trail guy i like it here and there but i'm not going to spend all day doing it you know like i'm going to be honest with you i don't fucking like the flow trail in in uh in demo forest i don't um it's only really smooth and operational maybe a month out of the year the rest of the time it's full of breaking bumps it's funny that you say that because i i've i've known that about you for a while and the first time that i rode flow i rode it about a week after they finished doing all their maintenance yeah and it fucking dialed and yeah. i rode it again about a month ago and i'm editing that video right now and it was just so fucked up yeah like it, the experience was not the same. Like no. it was really like the first time I rode it was like going to an amusement park and riding a roller coaster for the first time. Right. Like all you wanted to do is go home and think about it some more and rub your crotch and then go again, you know? Yeah. And, and then the second time I rode it was like, Oh, Oh wow. They're, like I came through this one corner and then in the middle of the berm is like this huge, like, like erosion spot, you know, yep. where it's, like a tire wash and you're like oh fuck dude like actually like moonlight because he, he, he dipped into that sunk a fork and like flew over the top of a berm yeah it's definitely like that that experience i can understand if you live locally to that why that maybe that trail is is not not the, the greatest to you yeah i mean <clears throat> you know counter to my point i like the gnar and you'd be like, well, why don't you like the flow trail when it's not? It's like, well, because it's not supposed to be that, right? Like, I like a trail that's built the way it's supposed to be built and riding it for what it is. So if I'm going to be on the flow trail, I want to fucking rail that bitch, you know? But right. if I'm going to go ride NAR, I know I'm going to have to ride a little bit slower and pick better lines and, you know, just be on the ball a little bit more. It's, it's a different experience, right? As a big dude uh, I, and, and following you on the trails, like, I can say that I've been really like surprised by by how well you ride and and but I can say that we've we've ridden in some spots in Santa Cruz where like I've come up to it and it's it, it's been like Santa Cruz is definitely they like steep there like yep. seriously fucking steep and I've come up to some stuff where it's just like the best way I could explain it would be like if you were sitting on the side of a half pipe and you're just like you oh, can I'm never fucking <laughs> Like but you can attest when we, when we written wrote uh, Pacifica. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mean New Zealand? Yeah. No, 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 no. no, no. Pacifica and that big like rock waterfall. Yeah, yeah. 
there's just some some insane insane stuff so let's um let, let's go ahead and turn this over and see if there's anybody out there in the uh in the chat section that has anything they want to throw out to richard we can we can answer some questions because uh i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and spin my wheels for a minute and just run my mouth while the chat starts popping up do you guys have anything you want to ask richard or uh c lock because he likes to talk um we'll go ahead and throw throw that out there right now so in the meantime while we're waiting for the chat to pop up um out of the places that you've ridden where is the place that you want to ride new zealand <laughs> Well, that was a short question. For a, so, for a second, for a second time. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was awesome. So, um, no, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff in Colorado and Utah that I want to get active to. t -Lock says, why New Zealand? Um, I've just heard they've got a really good mountain bike culture out there. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of the trails and it looks fantastic, you know. So Mark Rides Bike says, what is one of the most challenging designs that you've done? Hmm. One of the most challenging designs. Um, I've had a couple people ask for like full custom designs. Yeah, yes, sir. Question, question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Roberts was pretty challenging because uh, he didn't know what he wanted until he fucking wanted it. Uh, and so, you know, we, we redid a couple let me, things. Let me back the fuck up here, buddy. Hold on a second. No, 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 no. Robert Thank waits till the last minute to do everything because then it only takes a fucking minute. <laughs> also true. I think for me, I think the reason that you and I bump heads, ever, and I tell you, I was joking earlier, but not joking when I said I'm the most fucking difficult customer. And I think it's because I <laughs> am a pseudo designer as well. So I have he like, emphasis on the pseudo. Yes, very emphasis on the pseudo. <laughs> but like, I have a. a a design idea and he's an artist as well as well you know so it's like his idea may be a little different than mine and somehow we have to uh, like it's almost like a little relationship that we have to go through let's, let's every call time it this. I'm a designer in the way that an executioner is a hairstylist okay Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking hacking off heads and you're like so are we good you know like, no no <laughs> I can't. Wait I start working so for you. True, man. <laughs> I fucking nailed it, man. <laughs> Robert's right. got a guillotine, oh, and they're I like, he's like oh, just a little off the top, or. <laughs> <laughs> I saved your life at the fucking at, at the uh, the oh, German man. restaurant, so I'm just gonna say. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so. Uh, she, who, who knew Robert would stop me from choking on his wiener? You know, I mean. <laughs> Hey man, us Germans will kill anybody we any way we can. So right. <laughs> Whoa, hey, that's a dark alley we just turned down. <laughs> <laughs> so Shady MTB wants to you know, uh, do you wrap full face helmets? Uh, I I do. Um, <clears throat> I actually outsource my 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 wrapping. I have a guy here in the Bay Area. He's been doing it for about twenty years. He's like one of the godfathers of it. He's fantastic. Um, so I work on the design and then I, I have him wrap it. He's very reasonably priced, although, you know, he's not the cheapest. I'll, I'll admit that, but he also stands behind his product and, uh, does a great job. So we can do that. Yes. So, and you have a guy that will wrap a whole frame too. Like if somebody just wants yep. to get like, a control. A wrap, will, a wrap will run you about 150 for, uh, for the, uh, for the actual wrap job and then you know based on the different kinds of material out there it can run the gamut plus design time so i mean you can look at a wrap job for around 500 bucks or you could get it done for i don't know 300 bucks you know so but if, if they're local to you that makes it a lot easier otherwise they gotta tear the frame down ship you the mm -hmm. frame. You well they it. still have to tear it down and if you know separate the front from the rear triangle uh and clean it it has to be just absolute balls clean to be able to be wrapped so uh, my balls aren't very clean, so I guess we're fine. Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Making some abundant goss over there. Right. So <laughs> I noticed in the background there, um, you got your logo up there, that little sticker. So you, uh, you're a heavy metal fan? Oh, yeah. Big big time. Uh, actually going to be going to see Slayer here on the 26th at the SAP Center, so I'm very excited about that. Going to take my son. It's their last uh, tour. So I figured uh, baptism by fire. <clears throat> literally 
So you have, you have kids? What do you got? I have a an 11 year old son, and I have a four, almost five year old daughter. Right on. Yeah. Um, outside outside of being a father, you're a mountain biker. You're running right. this. Business. You do anything else for fun outside of mountain biking? Uh, work at this point. Um, I used to tattoo. I'd really like to get back into that at some point, but uh, in order to do that, I need the website to be a little bit more efficient and take on a lot of the design uh, incidences that I run into. Um, but I'd love to get back into that. What was the funniest tattoo you ever did? Um, so one night after copious amounts of booze, we had gone to a uh, an art show in San Francisco. And this dude had an entire art show where he literally colored in tree branches with pencil. So he basically just colored trees with pencils. Um, and then we're on our way back and stopped for some drinks. And two of my buddies were like, wouldn't it be funny if we got some silly tattoos? So one of them ended up getting uh, a squirrel reaching for his nuts. And then my other buddy got a rooster with boxing gloves on next to his dick for it was a cock fight. Yeah. So... Those are the best. I, I now I'm definitely understanding why you and I are friends. So then, <laughs> Becker event, there's going to be a tattoo booth, right, dude? I I I still have the machines, man. We'll break them out for the next event. That's going to be really sanitary. What um? So you were you were at the Downeyville event as well? Yeah. What what um? What what did you take away from that? You know, you've got a lot of loyal fans, man, and you're you're a relatable dude. You're not. You know, here's the thing. Us everyday riders watch these videos of these fucking amazing riders, and we're like, yeah, I'd love to ride like that, but let's be honest, I'm not going to ride like that. So when you get to see ordinary dudes riding at an ordinary pace on amazing trails, it's awesome because you're like, ah, I, I understand the trail now. I can see that that's a speed I'm probably comfortable with, and he can do it, I can do it, right? And, and, it, and it motivates people, but I, I just think on a level, you're, you're, you're relatable. You're you're a real dude, and that goes a long way in my book. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Who was um out of the people that you've met from um working in the bike industry now? Like, who were some people that really like stood up to you as like stand up guys? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I would say Andrew Taylor, um, and you met him at the at the Norco camp. For for as as an amazing a rider as he is. You know, he's just a dude. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't. For people that don't know names, Andrew Taylor is a Rampage rider, right? He yeah, rides. he used to ride Rampage. He used to be a. I mean, he used to have this event called uh, AT Showdown here in the Bay Area, and they build these huge, ridiculous ramps, and these dudes would be doing like you know double backflip uh, while they're spinning their bars and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, you should go follow Andrew Taylor, man. Um, he, he, he's traveling around the United States, riding all over the United States right now. Um, good dude. Good dude. And he's one of my sponsored riders, you know? Um, right. yeah. So if somebody's hemming and hawing about like changing, like, like doing a custom bike, what would be the reason that you think that they should? Who's the I customer? Look, not everybody wants to look like everybody else. Plain and simple, right? I mean, that's the idea of custom. And and my big thing with stickers is here's the great thing about stickers. It offers a degree of protection. And also, you know, when it comes time to sell your bike, which we all do, you can pull those stickers off and you got a, a frame that's been protected and it's the regular stock color. So it appeals to a wider audience of people when you go to resell it, right? Whereas if you were to say, I'm going to go paint my frame and I want to paint it fucking metallic green, you've alleviated a ton of people that are going to buy that bike from you. And so this is a way to make the bike yours, but at the same time, not desecrate it in a way that makes it inv uh, un unvaluable to other people, you know? Or you can upsell it because it's custom, and then if they don't like it, then they can just take it off. <laughs> well, one of the things that I've, I've, I've been toying with the idea of, you know, show me, show me a picture of you selling a bike or show me a picture of a receipt that you just bought a bike, and I'll give you a discount on some decals for, uh, you know, making the bike yours, you know? So that's, that's one idea. So let's talk about that real quick as we're wrapping up here then. So what's the process if you want these off your bike? Does it fuck your bike up? 
Not at all. Not at all. Um, they peel right off, right off. And if they leave any residue, just take some rubbing alcohol and hit it and you can wipe it right off. A little Windex or something like that. And they're good yep, to go. Yeah, Windex first too. Right on, man. Is there anything you want to say to everybody before we, we, we sign out here? Man, uh, you know, for those of you that have bought stuff from me in, in the past, you know, thank you for your support, man. Um, and those of you who haven't, you know, give me a call and let's see if we can't make something happen for you. And hopefully we can uh, we can make you happy with what you're riding, you know, refresh an old bike or make a new bike look even awesome, more awesome. And, uh, you know, custom is the new standard. So, yeah, if you guys want to follow him on Instagram, it is at Stickard, S-T-I-K-R-D. And the hashtag, hashtag custom is the new standard is where most of the, the pictures if you want to see some other people's designs and stuff like that, go to Instagram, check that out. You got Instagram, you got Facebook too? Yeah, you got Facebook too. It's just right stickered. On. Stickered. So that's that, man. But hey, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to time here with us on, on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, it was good hanging out and chatting. Yeah, so, man. Thank you for having me. Seriously. So for all you guys out there, man, it only takes a bike to be a biker. Get the fuck out and be one, right, bitches? <laughs>